Hi, I'm Lindsay with Valentium, and I'm talking with medtech industry leaders on how they change lives for a better world. The inventions and technologies are fascinating, and so are the people who work with them. There was a period of time where I realized fundamentally my job was to go hang out with really smart people that are saving lives and then do work that would help them save more lives. I got into the business to save lives, and it is incredibly motivating to work with people who are in that same business, saving or improving lives. What better industry than where I get to wake up every day and just save people's lives? These are extraordinary people doing extraordinary work, and this is The Leading Difference. Hello, and welcome to The Leading Difference Podcast. I'm your host, Lindsay, and I am excited to introduce you to my guest today, Rebecca Whitney. Rebecca is a tenacious and passionate business leader with over 20 years of experience leading both large and small organizations in the medtech space. As ZimV Spine Global President, Rebecca leads a team that designs, develops, and commercializes spinal implants to treat patients with spine-related disabilities. ZimV is the market leader in motion-preserving solutions for the spine, and Rebecca and her team are passionate about expanding patient access to these innovative technologies. Hello, welcome to the show, Rebecca. I'm so glad to have you here. (laughs) Thank you, Lindsay. I'm really looking forward to this. Absolutely. I would love if you don't mind starting off by telling us just a little bit about yourself and your background and how you got into medtech. Sure. So I grew up in a suburb of Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm the oldest of three children and have always been kind of inherently pretty driven. And so What happened is just because of my age and a bunch of AP credits, I was done with college at the University of Utah at age 20 and realized that was too young for me to jump into the workforce. And so I went straight into grad school to get an MBA. And while I was there, I took a summer internship with BD Medical that turned into a full year opportunity. And it was really great. I learned a ton about product management, the medical device industry. And when I was in the final spring of my MBA, they actually offered me a full-time position. And so I jumped right into it and didn't realize at the time just how fortunate I was to launch this career into med tech. But I've always felt very fortunate to have found a career and an industry that I enjoy so much. It's been love at first sight, and I've never left the med tech space since. So professionally, it's been just a great run. And then personally, I live in Boulder, Colorado with my husband, James, and We definitely embrace a work hard, play hard approach. We love the outdoors. We love adventure travel and are always looking to find ways to optimize our life to the fullest. So we actually met a guy on a backpacking hiking trip about three or four years ago in Escalante National Park. And this has always stuck with me because he said to us every day, do something that makes you feel more alive. And that resonated with me because we've always tried to live our life that way. And so it's been really great. So my job is a huge part of who I am, but also I like to have as much fun as possible, as many adventures as possible when I'm not working. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Feel more alive. That's such a great way of capturing it. I've heard variations on that. One of my favorites is do something every day that inspires your soul. I I love that too, of the feel alive, because there are some days too where you might not be feeling super inspired by whatever your circumstances happen to be at the time, but the feeling more alive seems very attainable because you could just go out into nature if that's something you very much enjoy, or maybe you put on some of your favorite music and you just let that absorb. Okay. I'm getting carried away, but I love that. (laughs) No, I agree. And to your point, it can be five minutes. It can be, you know, a, a huge adventure, but I think just that mentality and it stuck with me. I think about it every day. So anyway, it's just a nice reminder that life is short and take advantage while we can. Yeah. So looking back at growing up and obviously I love the fact that you dove kind of straight into the med tech world. And that sounds like a happy coincidence, so to speak. But looking back, would you have ever anticipated that's a field you might end up in? Or was it kind of a surprise? No, it was totally a surprise, a very happy, lucky one. I have always said my life and my career has followed a series of happy accidents, if you will. And so this was one of those where I was getting my MBA. I actually thought I was going to go into finance and I had interned at Merrill Lynch and so had full intentions of going down the finance path. And 
when I took this internship in marketing, I realized that, okay, there are a couple things about this that are really clicking for me. One, marketing brought that data and analytical element together with the commercial and strategic elements that I love. And so I kind of found a sweet spot in product marketing at a very early age. And in the med tech space, I remember the boss that hired me, he said, medical devices are recession proof. And well, that's not always the case, especially when it comes to elective surgeries in times of COVID, for the <laughs> most part, that's been true. And so I kind of fell into the industry, but feel so very fortunate that I hopefully am helping to impact patient lives at the other end of all this. So um, never look back and never, ever even thought about making a switch. Yeah. Yeah. So what exactly does your role entail these days? How are you combining some of those interests and your passion for this particular industry? So what I'm doing now is I lead our global spine organization and we make and manufacture and produce spinal implants. And so we help people with back pain or, or related pain to any type of back or spinal cord injury. And I love the global responsibility. I can get into that a little later, but yeah. international travel has always been a passion of mine. And so being able to work internationally is just fantastic because I think it brings just a whole different perspective to healthcare and patient needs and some of those variable aspects as you work throughout the globe. And I also love leading teams. And so having this cross-functional responsibility to, to set the strategy and then mobilize the various functions and team members to get behind the strategy and execute is just really great. I've been in all different parts of med tech throughout my career. I will say that working in the spine space has been one of the most rewarding just because you're able to see firsthand the impact that these products are having on patients' lives. And whether it's alleviating pain or getting their lifestyle back, it's just very rewarding when we hear from patients who benefits from the products and the solutions that we've been able to bring to market. Yeah, I can only imagine. Are there any particular moments that stand out to you as clearly confirming that this was the right choice of industry for you? I know you're so passionate about the space and the spinal aspect in general, so I'm curious what kind of moments have you had where you thought, oh my word, I know why I'm here? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. And I will tell you that in this particular job, in this industry, there is a product that, that we have brought to market that is unique and it treats pediatric scoliosis. So these kids that are coming in mm. and are needing basically to be addressed because they've got a curve in their back, the traditional standard of care is to put a bunch of rods and screws up and down their back and then fuse their spine into alignment. And while that clinically solves the problem in most instances, we have developed an innovative way to, to basically provide the same procedure for these patients that are properly indicated, but we do it without fusing their back. And so we have this product called the Tether that we brought to market in 2019. And leading up to 2019, we partnered with thought leading surgeons, the FDA, parent advocates, and a whole slew of others to advocate to bring this technology to market. And when we hear from these kids who have had the surgery and they're back to gymnastics and cheerleading and horseback riding, skiing, snowboarding, when we hear from these kids and their parents, it is such a wonderful endorsement. And I can't take the credit for the innovation. Those are our very talented engineers and researchers. But to know I've had a small hand and our company has had a hand in helping change the trajectory of these kids' lives. It is truly inspiring. And we bring in patients all the time to speak to our internal team members. And it just really kind of puts the context behind all the hard work, whether it's the engineers or the shipping and operations teams who are making sure the product gets to the right spot, the salespeople who are out selling it. It's just really impactful. So I would say that's probably the clearest example of every time I hear from a patient, it is just another reinforcement that I made the right choice and that there's something really special about this medical device industry when you can see how it helps patients. Oh my goodness. Yes. As an adult, I'm sure that kind of an operation or procedure would be just as impactful, but I got a little choked up thinking about a child who has this condition that maybe is inhibiting their dreams of becoming a gymnast or even just as a hobby, but something that they love. And then to have that hope restored again, that's, that's immeasurable. <laughs> that impact yeah. is immeasurable. You know, it, it really is. And I say this all the time. This is a true passion project for so many of us. And Internally, we have a team saying, and kind of a mantra, if you will, is having the courage to do things that haven't been done before. 
And we all kind of got behind this starting several years ago to say, this is the right thing to do. And we're going to keep advocating to, to get this technology to market because no one's done it before. We were the very first. And to be able to actually see this materialize in the lives of these kids. Yeah. To your point, it's just, it's very inspiring for all of us that have worked on it and we're not going to stop. We really are very passionate about continuing to develop this space. That is wonderful. I know that you are also really passionate about leadership and leading teams. I know that's an aspect of your job that is enjoyable to you. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about how you got into that leadership role and a little bit about your philosophy towards leading and managing teams. Yeah. So I'll start with my philosophy. I think everyone has a slightly different take on what does leadership mean to them. And to me, First of all, I've always felt very humbled and honored to be in a leadership role, and I take that responsibility very seriously. As I've worked throughout my career and observed leaders, I have found that the most effective and the most admirable leaders are those that take a true interest in the individual. Because at the end of the day, we're all people, and I personally believe that the basic principles of healthy and strong relationships are the same whether it's a sibling, a spouse, a friend, a colleague, a boss, or an employee. And so I think that you've got to start with two basic principles for me, trust and mutual respect. And it's very important to me that I build and establish and maintain trust with the teams I lead, as well as my colleagues and my leaders. And so that's kind of number one. Those are table stakes for me. I think, too, I have learned over the years that leadership does not necessarily mean being liked all the time. And early on when I was starting out, that was difficult for me to learn. And it was hard. And I remember it was about six months into my career. And at Becton Dickinson BD Medical, we had just gone through a pretty major layoff. And I was eating lunch in the cafeteria. And the division president came and joined my colleague and me, which was intimidating because I was fresh into the role. And he was just making conversation with us and asked how we were feeling about these layoffs that had just happened. And I said to him, yeah, I don't know how you do it. I can't imagine having to lay off all these people. And I'll never forget this. He looked at me and he said, you know, you really can't call yourself a leader until you've hired and fired. You have to be able to make the tough decisions. And as a young 22 year old product manager, I remember sitting there thinking, wow, I I can't imagine what that must feel like, but he wasn't wrong. And I think what I've learned over the years is if you can operate with those principles of mutual trust and mutual respect, it builds up that bank account with these individual relationships that you have as a leader. And so when you have to make the tough calls and you have to make the unpopular decisions, hopefully if you can at least help people understand the why behind some of these decisions, I've seen people do this really well and I've seen people do it very poorly. And I am by no means perfect at it, but I'm constantly striving to be as transparent as possible so that people at least understand the why. And then finally, I would say, Leadership is so much about creating the right environment for healthy teamwork. And so for me, I always love it when I start to see my various leaders on a team click and start to build those connection points without me in the middle of it. Because to me, that is an indicator that this team is starting to really work together in a high performing, high trust fashion. And that is the secret sauce behind every team I've ever led is creating that environment getting the right chemistry between the various team members in the group, and then watching those connection points really take hold. To me, that's where the magic happens. And I think that's what makes it all worth it. Yeah. Yeah. So you've obviously had a really lovely career so far, and I'm sure we'll just continue. But you know, one interesting element is it sounds like you had opportunities to lead fairly young into your career. And I'm wondering how you approached perhaps teams that had a diversity in terms of ages. And was that ever intimidating to you? If maybe you were coming in as a younger leader than some of your followers, was that ever a challenge or how did you handle that? You know, it was, and that absolutely happened. I was probably 26 years old when I started managing people that were older than I was. And the whole team was, it wasn't just one or two. And Initially, I was extremely intimidated because I felt I had that imposter syndrome. You know, what right do I have? And it did take me a little bit to to feel comfortable. I think for me, I just told myself, look, somebody had confidence in me and somebody put me in this role for a reason. I have to trust myself and I'm going to prove to my team through my actions and earn their trust and show that they're in good hands with me. And luckily, I had a team that was very receptive. And I think when they saw 
how I approached it and what I brought to the table, they were very supportive. But yeah, initially I had to get over my own internal talk track that said, you know, this doesn't make any sense. Why in the world would somebody take direction from me when I'm 10, 20, 30 years younger than they are? <laughs> but it was a great learning opportunity. And frankly, it continued for not so much now because I'm a little further on in my career, but that was the case for at least the first decade of my leadership opportunities. And so it was important for me to learn that early on. Yeah, absolutely. As a woman leader in a field that isn't predominantly women led usually, what are some of the pros and cons you've seen? What are some of the exciting elements about that? And then what are some of the opportunities for growth as the industry continues to evolve and change over time? That is a great question, especially in the orthopedic spine world. It's extremely male dominated, at least historically it has been. And just like managing team members that were older than I was, I had to learn very early on that, especially when I started out, I was likely going to be one of, if not the only females in the room. And I had a boss fairly early on that, that gave me some great advice because by default, I remember, first of all, I have horrible handwriting. I'm probably the worst scribe you could ever pick out of a group. I've just never, <laughs> ever had good penmanship. And I was constantly being asked to take notes on flip charts and I was doing it. And my male boss pulled me aside and he said, you know, we teach people how to treat us. And he said, I know that you're just being collaborative and helpful, but you've been taking notes for the last six times we've been in a group. He said, the next time you're asked to take notes, say no. And mm. that seems like a little thing, but I did. And not because I was refusing to take notes, but I just was making sure it was a little more balanced of an approach. Mm. That's a silly example. But I think that for me, I had to learn early on that there was nothing wrong with me being one of or the only woman in a room, just like there was nothing wrong with me being on the younger side of people in the room. And again, there's that imposter syndrome, but I think having confidence in my abilities and recognizing that the more I could be comfortable in my own skin, that was what would enable me to bring probably a different and unique perspective. I was told in my 20s that I should dress in subtle tones and black and gray and navy blue suits. This was from hmm. kind of a leadership coach. And I remember thinking about that and I thought, I don't want to wear black and gray and navy blue suits. And so I've always tried to keep my own brand and my own authenticity while at the same time recognizing that it is difficult to kind of be the one outlier of a group. I will say that as time has gone on, I'm very pleased that the workforce is starting to better reflect our society. And I think that gender diversity certainly is expanding, which is nice. But my advice for anybody out there, regardless of gender or ethnicity, or even just diversity of thought is recognize that we are put into these roles because of what people see in us, our abilities and our potential. And if we stifle that in any way, shape or form, the company and our teams and our customers are not getting what we have to offer. And I think the more comfortable I got with that, the more effective I've been able to be. Mm. Oh my goodness. That is excellent advice. Really. Thank you for sharing that. That really hit home. I appreciate that perspective that you've had. You've had such an opportunity to really grow in your role. And I just love seeing that progression. So yeah, thank you for that advice. <laughs> that was really good. I'm curious, how do you these days continue prioritizing your own learning and growth as a leader? Are there still things that you keep doing in order to sharpen those skills? What does it look like now for you? Yeah, so I'll start with something that probably is an obvious answer that most people give you, but podcasts are amazing. And I'm probably <laughs> a little late to the party on this because I didn't start listening to podcasts until COVID. But I have found that as a fantastic way. I mentioned I live in Colorado. I will spend Saturdays and Sundays out on very long walks, either around Boulder where I live or even up in the mountains. And I will just binge listen to podcasts on all different types of topics, leadership, business, life skills, you name it. And they're not all work oriented, but I have found that to be a really good way to just get a sampling of advice, opinion, and learnings from a wide variety of people. So that's one. And I think for me, being able to do that on the weekend, disconnect a little bit, and really dig into these podcasts that I compile and save up. It, it's just, it's a major reset for me in a very good way. I'm sure I drive my team crazy because I'm constantly sending them these podcasts over the weekend <laughs> as I listen to them, <laughs> as well as my family. But that's been really great for me. I would say the second major thing is I love to travel. My husband and I look to enhance our lives any way we can. And I have found that one way that helps me learn is looking for those connection points between my personal life and my professional life. And mm. what I mean by that is 
I try to be very authentic and consistent. So whether I'm in the workplace or at home with my family or on my own, the more consistent I can be is a healthier place for me because you're not having to put on one persona versus the next. And so the more I can find those connection points, meaning if I learn something in my personal life, I can apply it into my professional life. And to me, that's where I get a lot of my continuous growth and development. So if it's tackling a big aggressive hike I haven't done before, I find myself while I'm training for that and doing the hike, I find myself thinking about ways I can push the team at work or push myself. So strangely, as I've continued to grow in these roles and in my personal life, that balance between work and life has blurred. But I think that's been to my benefit, both personally and professionally. So I'm always looking for opportunities to enrich my personal life because I do think that transfers back into the workforce as well. Yeah. So what are you looking forward to next in terms of maybe both personally, professionally, and as your company continues to innovate and develop new things, what are you excited about these days? So our company, Zimvi, is relatively new. We were spun out from Zimmer Biomed, our former parent company, not even 18 months ago. And it's been really fun to help shape yeah. this new identity and this new culture. And talking about this tethering device I mentioned earlier, we have another device that allows us to treat cervical neck issues with a, a disc replacement, which long story short means we're able to preserve motion for these adults who are looking to have their pain addressed. And so wow. what we're trying to do, and we do have a mission, we've got a number of patients that we're trying to treat in 2023 for both this cervical disc replacement device, which we call MOBC, as well as this tethering device for pediatric scoliosis patients. And so what's next for us is continuing to develop these markets and make sure that we bring these amazing solutions to every patient who is indicated to receive it. And so that's gonna keep us busy for quite some time. I'm sure we have work to do beyond that, but we're just also passionate about it. That's definitely what's next for us, at least professionally, is continuing to carry that forward. And then personally, it's always about the next adventure to, to push ourselves. So we're actually headed to the Grand Canyon in December. My husband and I are with my sister and brother and their spouses, and we're going to do a multi-day hike backpacking trip. So really looking forward to that and just looking forward to being outdoors with my favorite people doing something that challenges us physically and spending a lot of good quality time together as well. Oh, that sounds so exciting. Both the company's trajectory and then your upcoming adventure, that all sounds <laughs> really fun. So I'm sure that will be a lot to look forward to. It's busy, but that's the way we like it. Absolutely. I'll, I would always rather be busy than bored. <laughs> Well, pivoting just for fun, imagine someone were to offer you a million dollars to teach a masterclass on anything you want. It doesn't have to be in your industry, but it could be. What would you choose to teach and why? So I will say that my dream job, if I weren't doing my current dream job, has always been to be a travel writer. I would love to travel the world and then write about my experiences. And so if I could do that and then teach a masterclass on it, to me, that would just be the most amazing opportunity. I am driven by two things. One is influence or language and ideas. I love to communicate. and I love to inspire others by speaking and sharing, whether that's talking or writing. And so to me, to share that know-how and knowledge and passion about travel and not just the regular beaten path, but having these adventures that are off the beaten path and the food and the culture and the people and the adventures I would love to to master that and then teach people how to go tackle that so that others can share in that passion and see what the world has to offer. So that to me just sounds like a dream come true. I would love to do that. <laughs> yes. Yes. That sounds like an amazing masterclass. And yes, another dream job for sure. I'm just curious because I completely agree with you that in traveling internationally is such such a gift and it is so important if you can do it in terms of broadening your horizons. But I'm Curious, what do you think are the main one or two things that, that you find are the most important elements of traveling abroad? So I would say the first thing is don't be afraid to say yes. My mm -hmm. oldest nephew just graduated from high school. And in my letter that I wrote him as part of his graduation gift, I said, bias yourself towards saying yes when you're out on these trips and these adventures. And I think that when you're on an international trip, it can be really easy to just stay in your comfort zone. I'll give you an example. My brother and I were traveling in Africa several years ago, and we had a driver pick us up when we landed in, where were we? It was off the coast of Tanzania. And it just happened to be the last day of Ramadan. And he invited us back to his home 
We never met this man before to break fast after 30 days of Ramadan. And I think if we had been less open to trying new experiences, we both would have said no way. But we said yes. And we had the most incredible experience that enriched our whole time. It was Zanzibar. That's where we were. And it was just one of the most incredible travel days of our lives. And so I think the first thing is being open to the experiences and biasing yourself towards saying yes whether it's a dish or a food that looks terrifying to, to try or just <laughs> seeking something out that enriches the experience. I think that's one. And then two is staying flexible because travel these days, especially international, it's going to be fraught with setbacks, whether it's a train strike or a ferry schedule. So just being very flexible to kind of roll with it because I've seen myself included too many instances where some of those glitches can unfortunately ruin the experience. And so being open to the new experiences and saying yes, and then staying flexible to just roll with it and take the trip as it comes and let it go down whatever path presents itself, I think are two really important ingredients for maximizing a global travel experience. Could not agree more. <laughs> yes. Okay. What is one thing you wish to be remembered for after you leave this world? So this is probably a very cliche answer, but it's really true. I, I've thought about this and I do want to be remembered for the way I make people feel. And I say that because speaking about the job first, I feel like people have a choice and any job that we take has the day-to-day -day tasks and requirements. But when I look back on my career, by far the most rewarding and the most challenging elements have involved people. And so I think whether it's a tough situation or a very successful celebratory situation, I want to be remembered for how I made people feel. And hopefully that's a positive thing. And that translates outside of work too. My nephews, for example, and my nieces, I want to be remembered for enriching their lives and giving them new experiences. But I also want them to know that I was there for them. And the people that matter most to me, I think it's just very important. It's that old cliche saying, people won't remember what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. So mm -hmm. to me, if I'm doing my job right inside and outside of work, hopefully people's impression after I'm gone is net positive in terms of how I made them feel. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that ties right into your discussion earlier about leadership and having that bank, right? And putting in those credits. And, and so when things do get a little difficult, sometimes you have had a net positive in the end. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And then final question. What is one thing that makes you smile every time you see or think about it? So I am a big believer that, yes, we all have these milestone events and these big trips and things that come up, but I really look for the little things that bring joy on a daily basis. And when I took this role about two and a half years ago, my husband and I said, okay, we, we've got to find a way to stay connected because my days get busy. Even evenings are not that predictable. And so we have started getting up very early, which isn't as awful as I thought it would be. So we're typically up by about 4.30 in the morning. And one of the reasons we do this is because we have this daily ritual now where my husband makes the lattes, he's much better than I am. And we just sit together for about 30 minutes every morning. And if I'm on the road, we do it through FaceTime. And it's just this dedicated little moment of time before the day gets crazy and busy where we connect, we have our coffee, we watch the sunrise and we talk. And I look forward to it when I open my eyes in the morning and throughout a busy, stressful day or trip, knowing that we have that daily touch point to kind of anchor us both always puts a smile on my face. And it just starts the day off on the perfect tone. And I look forward to it all the time. And it definitely makes me smile. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That sounds like such a lovely time set aside to prioritize your relationship and get that special connection time. And of course, a good latte never hurts. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, Rebecca, thank you so very much for joining us today. I really appreciate your perspective and your advice, especially for those who might be younger in leadership roles, maybe women who are coming into the med tech world. So thank you for that. And we are honored to be making a donation on your behalf as a thank you for your time today to Opportunity International which designs, delivers, and scales innovative financial solutions that helps families living in extreme poverty build sustainable livelihoods and access quality education for their children. So thank you for choosing that as the organization. And we just wish you the most continued success as you work to change lives for a better world. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I so appreciate the opportunity. 
Yes, my absolute pleasure. And thank you also to our listeners for tuning in. And if you're feeling as inspired as I am right now, I'd love it if you'd share this episode with a friend or two, and we will catch you next time. The Leading Difference podcast is brought to you by Valentium. Valentium is a contract design and manufacturing firm specializing in the development, production, and post-market support of diagnostic and therapeutic active medical devices, including implantables and wearables for neuromodulation and other class three indications. Valentium's core competencies include electrical design, mechanical design, embedded software, mobile apps, contract manufacturing, embedded cybersecurity, OT cybersecurity, systems engineering, human factors and usability, and automated test systems. Valentium works with clients worldwide, from startups seeking seed funding to established Fortune 100 companies. Visit valentium.com to explore your next step in medical device development.